My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. In 1965, singer Jackie D. Shannon had a hit with the Burt Backrack Hal David classic, What the World Needs Now is Love. David's timeless lyric seems as or more relevant today than when it was first recorded almost 55 years ago. Is there a way that each of us, individually and collectively, can return to kindness, decency, and authenticity in these troubled times? My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, Deborah Landwehr Engel, says that by following 10 simple practices, we can transform our world with love. Deb Engel is the author of The Only Little Prayer You Need and Let Your Spirit Guide Speak, a simple guide for a life of purpose, abundance, and joy. She's a longtime teacher of A Course in Miracles, as well as a widely traveled speaker, workshop leader, and writing mentor. She joins us this week to discuss her latest book, Be the Light You Are, 10 Simple Ways to Transform Your World with Love. Please welcome to Destination Unlimited, Deb Landwehr Engel. Good evening, Deb. Good evening. It's so good to be here with you. And it's so nice to have you back. It's been about two years since we discussed your book at that time, Let Your Spirits Guide Speak. What have you been up to since then? Well, definitely working on this new book, the Be the Light That You Are book. The idea for that one came about just after Let Your Spirit Guides Speak was published. So that's certainly been one of the things I've been focused on, uh, plus putting together some online courses, doing some mentoring, coaching, uh, staying busy in other ways, too, always with writing, publishing, and with spirituality. Wonderful. Now, for our listeners meeting you for the first time, please share about your personal spiritual path. Sure. Well, it really began when I was fairly young. I was always interested in spirituality. My parents created an environment at home where all of us kids, I'm the youngest of six, were really free to explore and discover and learn about the things that we were most interested in. And I just always had a deep, deep interest in metaphysics, in um, other worlds. My parents actually had kind of met each other and formed a relationship over their mutual connection and interest in these things. So I remember when I was little, I was reading magazines like Fate magazine and UFO magazine and and was always so absorbed in these stories of people who had had past life experiences or who had memories of other lifetimes. So that part always intrigued me. Plus, I was just very, very interested in the power of our minds to create our lives, to create, you know, whatever our dreams are to really make them come true. So starting from a very young age, I just did a lot of reading on my own, um, feel like as though I had a couple of key experiences with my own spiritual guidance when I was fairly young, and um, particularly at a time during my teenage years, when I was feeling pretty lonely and lost, as a lot of teenagers do, and felt as though I got a message from my guides one night that really started the internal change process for me that ended up uh, showing me that I would really never be lonely. I would always have friends. I would always be surrounded not just by the comfort and wisdom of my guides, but by wonderful people who I love. So they took a very lonely person, (laughs) um, I can remember it well, and really helped me see a different path in my life. Um, After college after a a marriage that lasted a few years when I was single and in my 30s I really started deeply looking at spiritual pursuits taking a lot of classes reading a lot of books and connecting with people who 
became my mentors and my teachers. So I feel very grateful for all of their wisdom. I feel like I stand on those teachings of so many people who lifted me up when I needed it and now have had the opportunity to share a lot of my own experiences and messages through these books. So I'm very, very grateful for that. Now, you had the blessing, as you had mentioned, of having parents who were very fascinated in following spiritual paths and different experiences. You had mentioned six, uh, one of six siblings. Uh, did any of your other uh, siblings have any uh, spiritual path or spiritual leaning? Well, I would say Probably the last four of us were all interested in spirituality in some form or another. One of my brothers started getting involved in transcendental meditation back in the late 60s, early 70s, back in the very early days when it was first introduced in the United States. Um, Actually, I live in Iowa, and some of your listeners may be familiar with Fairfield, Iowa, and Maharishi University there. Um, This particular brother went to that university for a while. So he was certainly very interested through meditation. A couple of other brothers and sisters, I think, also had those spiritual leanings. Um, So, but we all were able to just pursue that, whatever that interest was, in the way that we wanted to. Just out of curiosity, did your parents have a UFO contact experience? Not that they ever talked about. And it's interesting because they never really verbalized a lot of their interest in these things as we were growing up. But they certainly had a lot of books. They did a lot of reading. You know, they were reading books by Emmett Fox and Edgar Cayce. Um, We joined the Unity Church in Des Moines, Iowa, back when I was in junior high. And that, for me, was such a wonderful experience because the unity teachings are so in line with metaphysics, um, with love-based teachings of of Christianity. And so that opened up a whole new world. And they were very active in the unity church for quite a few years. Now, much of your work has a foundation in A Course in Miracles. For those not familiar with this, please describe what A Course in Miracles is about. Sure. Uh, The course came to be back in the 1960s. And the, it's basically three books in one. If you were to go to a bookstore, go online, and order A Course in Miracles, you would end up with a large, thick volume that actually has three books. The first is 31 chapters, which comprise the text of, of the course. The second is the workbook for students, and it includes 365 daily lessons, And then the third part is the manual for teachers, which when I first got the course and first started studying it, I thought that that was, you know, lesson plans for people who were teaching the course. Actually, it's more clarification of terms and supplemental information that helps you understand what the course is all about. Because A Course in Miracles, if you were to just pick it up, try to sit down and read it on your own, you might get discouraged (laughs) before you got through the first couple of pages of the first chapter. Not that it's not the best thing ever, because personally I think that it is, but it's written in such a way that it can be very difficult to get through on your own, which is why most people study the course through some sort of study groups or classes. The very basic teaching of the course is that we all have two minds. We have an ego mind that is very much based in fear, Fear that we're not enough, fear that we don't matter, fear that we will always disappoint others and that we don't deserve love. And it basically is always, its default is guilt, shame, anger, um, and even self-loathing. That's the part of us that can beat ourselves up so steadily and consistently and can also attack others. But, of course, this says that we also have this other mind, and that is our higher mind, our higher self. That's the mind that remembers that we're created by divine love. And so we are expressions and extensions of that love. And so in every moment of our lives, we have the opportunity to choose whether we are standing in that fear-based mind and living from that, or whether we're standing in the power and the grandeur of our higher mind, letting that divine love flow through us and extending it out into the world. So everything in the course is really helping us understand how we can access that higher mind more readily and shift our mind. It's really about mind training 
not in any kind of propaganda cultish sort of way, but simply because we all have that ability to focus on what we want rather than what we don't want. What's fascinating to me and how it has always been about A Course in Miracles is how it came to be. Just share briefly how that happened. Sure. Yeah, it happened, as I said, back in the 1960s, a woman named Helen Shuckman, who was a professor of psychology at Columbia University in New York. She and a colleague got together and talked about the fact that their their department was so contentious and thought there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a way to create some unity and some collegiality. Well, about that time, Helen, who was not a religious person at all, in fact, I believe she identified herself as an atheist at one point, she started having psychic dreams and told Bill, her colleague, about that. He said, well, you know, just pay attention, see what happens. So after a number of psychic dreams that seemed to be opening up something new in her, in her thinking, she one day heard a voice, and one of the first things that voice said was, this is A Course in Miracles, please take notes. Mm -hmm. So for years after that, she essentially took dictation and filled an entire stack of steno notebooks with all of the the teachings that came through her. So it's very much of a channeled work. Absolutely. And considering the fact that she was a professor of psychology, and I assume her bill was also a professor of psychology, is that correct? That's great. Uh-huh. And, and these two people were basically science bent. And then this woman who was a self-professed atheist before this experience happened were able to deliver this wonderful, wonderful work and uh, share it with the world, I think, in itself is a miracle. I believe so, too. Yeah, I think, you know, for the fact that she was an atheist and that she was a psychologist or that uh, she didn't have religious leanings of her own to taint or thwart what she was hearing. She literally was just taking dictation. And so I think she was obviously the perfect person to receive that information and write it down. My guest is Deborah Landwehr Engel. She's the author of Be the Light You Are. And we'll be back with more of Deb after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Tune in to The Practical Intuitive, Mind, Body, Spirit for the Real World with me, host Robin Fritz, Mondays at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 Eastern. I'll cover personal and business intuition, animal communication, mediumship, space clearing, past life regression, shamanic insights, energy healing, soul choice, and more, all to help you Tap your own intuitive and healing skills. No ifs, ands, or buts. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with, all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese, and guess what? Egg rolls showed up, like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Deb Engel. She's the author of Be the Light You Are. Ten Simple Ways to Transform Your World with Love. So, Deb, your first book was entitled The Only Little Prayer You Need, and your second, Let Your Spirit Guide Speak. What was the inspiration behind these, and what may readers who have not read them yet take away from them? Sure. For The Only Little Prayer You Need, that one came about, I can tell you the exact date, (laughs) January 11th of 2013, when I was having a very bad day. And I tell the whole story in the book, but the short version of it is that I was anxious, I was frustrated, I was angry over a number of different things that had been happening in my life. And I just thought, you know, after all of these years of spiritual study 
of studying A Course in Miracles, teaching the course, doing other kinds of things to, you know, to feel really connected. I still had these old tapes running through my head that were making me angry and feeling alone. So I really asked God, I asked a higher power to give me something that would help. And I heard these words float into my mind that became the prayer that the book is based on. I actually started writing the book that day because I could see and feel the power behind it. And the book was published um, in fall of 2014 with a foreword from the Dalai Lama, which was <laughs> one of the most unexpected and greatest surprises of my life. Uh, when I got that, not just an endorsement from the Dalai Lama, but a foreword from him, it was certainly an affirmation that the power behind this prayer was not just something I was imagining, but something that truly existed. That book has gone into eight printings, maybe nine now, I'm not sure, uh, has been translated into three different languages, is sold around the world. And I get emails from people all the time saying how much that prayer, this very simple prayer, has transformed their lives. So I'm so grateful for that day in January of 2013 um, and that message coming through. For Let Your Spirit Guides Speak, that one came about because after The Only Little Prayer You Need, my publisher came back, asked what my next book would be, and by that time, I was very clear that I'm not in charge of these books. So I asked my guidance, my higher power, what is the next book? And heard very clearly that I was supposed to write about spirit guides. This did not sit well with me because I'll tell you that even though I have been a very spiritual person, I haven't necessarily talked about it openly. Writing a book called The Only Little Prayer You Need was a huge stretch for me because I would talk about meditation, I would talk about, you know, connection, but I wouldn't really talk about prayer until that book. And I certainly didn't openly talk about the fact that I listened to my spirit guides. So what happened with that book is that as I started writing all of these memories from my own experiences with my guides started coming through, but a writing guide actually presented herself to me and helped me write that book. And I, you know, in the end, of course, I love the book. It too has just been so popular with readers because in all of my books, I try to make them very practical, very down to earth, simple language, clear terms, clear terminology very respectful of all spiritual and religious traditions, so that these are books that everybody can use. These are not about any religious doctrine or denomination. These are all truly just about being human beings and knowing that we can be connected with these vast spiritual resources, because it's so easy for us to forget that. Absolutely. What inspired you to write Be the Light You Are, and how does it differ from those previous books? What inspired me for this one is that a couple of years ago, I started hearing more questions among the students in my Course in Miracles classes, but also just in the general conversation out in the world, where I think a couple of years ago, you know, we started seeing people, we started seeing more division in the country and within ourselves as well. Um, that external division, you know, whatever happens externally is always a reflection of what's going on internally. So I think we all found ourselves in a place where we were starting to try to sort things out. What did we truly believe? What did we want? What was accept acceptable? What was not acceptable? So I started hearing questions, things like something simple. Um, one woman asked, you know, I get together with my friends who I've known for years and I love them. I still want to spend time with them. But after being involved in spiritual teachings for a while, I'm not in the same place they are anymore. They want to gossip and belittle other people, and I don't. How can I handle that and still stay friends with them? Or I'd hear questions like, you know, when I'm at home and I'm meditating, I'm filled with love, I'm filled with peace, I feel so good and connected with the world, and then I go out and I get on the freeway and somebody cuts me off, and instantly, I'm back to that fear-based mind and that anger again. What can I do to stay in that place of peace? Because that's where I want to live my life. Well, those questions made me realize that 
it's one thing to do a spiritual practice, but it really is a different thing to practice our spirituality. Yeah. And so I wanted to write a book that would be a guide, a handbook filled with examples, filled with language that we can pick up and use every day on how to handle these real life situations and do it according to universal teachings, things like letting go of judgment, rising above the drama, detaching with love, redefining the problem, um, just starting to see the world and ourselves in a different way so that we can live from that place of peace every day. What you shared is a real dilemma for many today who are grounded in a spiritual practice and yet find challenges in their personal and professional relationships. What do you say to them? Right. Well, I think, first of all, you're not alone, (laughs) because this is, I think, the teaching that all of us are here for. One of the things, of course, in Miracles is very clear about is that we need relationship. We have relationships with one another so that we can grow. What we need to learn from those relationships is always that we can learn either from fear or we can learn from love. And I think what the world encourages and what the world reflects to us is to learn about relationships from fear, fear that we won't be loved, fear that somebody is going to betray us, fear that we're going to disappoint someone or vice versa. But instead, we can really look at a different path of when we remember the light that we are, the love that we are, the connection that we have to God, to ourselves, to one another. And I use that word God inviting everyone to use a different word if that one doesn't work for you, higher power, creator, source energy, love, whatever it may be for you, that we have the choice in every moment to live our relationships, enter into those relationships, and maintain them, live them every day from a place of love instead. Now, of course, this is not easy. You know, this is not like we can just wave a magic wand and all of a sudden everything is bliss and peaceful every day. Our growth, why we're here, really, is to extend more love into this world, to be the extension of the divine love that created us. And we do that by sometimes being in conflict situations and choosing love instead of fear. Now, you started mentioning a couple of the 10 principles that you share in Be the Light You Are. Please enumerate all of the principles. Okay, sure. I'm just going to turn to the table of contents to make sure that I don't (laughs) speak any, because, (laughs) you know, I can remember five, six, (laughs) but all ten, I want to be sure that I've got them. So the very first one is Be the Light, and I say in the book, we're starting in possibly the hardest place, but it's also the place that we have to begin. The reason that it's the most difficult is that even though probably every world religion has some form of telling us that we are the light, be the light that you are, you are the light of the world. It's very difficult for most people to look themselves in the mirror and honestly say, without looking away, truly look themselves in the eye and say, I am the light of the world, and feel it. That can feel so arrogant, braggadocious, um, maybe even blasphemous for some people. So that first chapter is all about what does it mean to be the light of the world and how can we be sure that we are claiming that for ourselves. The second one is apply the power of your mind, which goes into more detail about what I've been saying about the two minds, the small ego fear-based mind and the higher mind. The third one is to foster self-love, which is different than what we typically think of. A lot of times we think of self-love as having a healthy salad and getting a massage, having a spa day, nothing wrong with those things at all. But this is self-love with a capital S. This is how do we nurture and get reacquainted with this higher self so that we are truly expressing ourselves from that place every day. The fourth one is to see only love. This is one of my favorites. Again, it's a teaching from the Course. A Course in Miracles says, see only love for that is what you are. And it also says, if you want only love, see nothing else. It goes back again to the teaching that we always have a choice. Knowing that we are love, we can see love in this world because we're seeing through those eyes. Whereas if we're in 
the smaller ego fear-based mind, we're going to be seeing what's wrong with the world rather than what's beautiful in the world. The next one is meet others without judgment. That's based on the idea that, you know, we all, I think, collectively agree, most of us anyway, that we need to not be judging ourselves or one another. But if we're starting that from a fear-based place, that's very hard to maintain. It's different when we come at it from being the light that we are and understand that it's it's not just about being good people, being nice people, even letting people be who they are, but it's much deeper than that. It's really honoring the light in every person. I think we're going to pick up with this on the next segment because I want to give you a time to mention your book. My guest this week is Deb Engel. She's the author of Be the Light That You Are. Deb, please tell our listeners where they can get your book and find out more about you and this work. Sure. My website is com, and that's D-E-B-R-A-E-N-G-L-E.com. So you can go there to find out more about the books. There are teleclasses that I offer, lots of events coming up, and you can get the books, of course, on all online sellers and at your local bookstore. And also you have events coming up in August and September. Please mention those. Sure. Yep. At the end of August, I'll be at Ferry Beach, which is a retreat center in uh, Maine. Beautiful, right on the beach in Maine. Gorgeous time of year to be there. I'll be there from August 24th through the 28th um, doing a retreat about hope. So we'll be talking about some of these things that we're talking about today in that retreat. And I'll also be at the Omega Institute September 12th, well, I'm sorry, September 13th through the 15th at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York. And that retreat will be based directly on the book, Be the Light That You Are. And we'll be back with more of Deb Engel and Be the Light That You Are after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Hi, it's Olivia Munn with my shelter pets, Frankie and Chance, reminding you that when you adopt a shelter pet, you discover all the things that make them unique. Adopt pure love at theshelterpetproject.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council, the Humane Society of the United States, and Maddie's Fund. Welcome back to The Dog Show. Up next, we have Satchmo. Satchmo is a member of the Shelter Pet Group. That's right, a group known especially for their couch-snuggling, ball-chasing, face-licking, and, of course, companionship. Now, let's see him in action. Look how he makes eye contact with his person. That's actually known as the treat stare. How intuitive, and now he appears to be excitedly turning in circles. Ah, the happy dance will come in with this group. But really, the best way to know an amazing shelter pet like Satchmo is to meet one. Visit theshelterpetproject.org today. Adopt. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Deborah Landwehr Engel. She's the author of Be the Light That You Are, 10 Simple Ways to Transform Your World with Love. So, Deb, before the break, you started talking about the 10 principles. Review very quickly the first five that we had mentioned. Sure. We had talked about be the light, apply the power of your mind, foster self-love, see only love, and meet others without judgment. So then we can pick up with the next one, which is detach with love. That one's based on the idea that we all form attachments, not just to other people, but to material possessions, to relationships, to expectations and outcomes. And those attachments can keep us locked in prison, (laughs) actually. It can keep us caged because I describe in the book, imagine that you have strings attaching you to all of these different possessions and relationships and people in your life, you really get a picture of how bound up we can be by all of the ways that we are putting expectations on others. So that chapter is how to cut those ties, not out of fear, but out of love so that we can be fully who we are and so can everybody else. 
Uh, the next one is to rise above the battleground, which is really about the idea that if we are coming from our fear-based mind, if we're in a conflict, if we are uh, feeling attacked or defense, then we're operating on the battleground of this world in our mind. But we can rise above that battleground, above the chaos and the drama, through choosing different thoughts and also through asking for the support of spirit. Then there's redefine the problem. That's one of my favorites, too. Again, it comes directly from A Course in Miracles, because the Course says that while we think there are millions of problems in this world, we could go on for days just naming problems that we can identify in our own lives or in this external world. The Course says that actually there's only one problem, and that is that we feel separate or believe that we're separate from God, ourselves, and others. So that chapter is all about taking a look at how you see problems from fear, from that belief in separation, and how things change when you see that you are totally connected and one with yourself, others, and spirit. Then practice true forgiveness. This one is kind of a mind-bending <laughs> chapter, I believe, because forgiveness sometimes can be a dirty word to people. It's, um, it can so often be seen as letting other people off the hook and can eventually lead to resentment and bitterness. There may be that intention to forgive, but you hold on to the pain, the sense of betrayal, and eventually that surfaces again, and you end up still being angry over whatever happened. This is practicing true forgiveness, which is seeing that forgiveness actually is about loving yourself more. And I give lots of examples about that in that chapter. And the final one is set yourself free, which talks about using the cumulative power of all of these different teachings and principles in the book to work with spirit very closely every day and really make a, a statement, a mission for yourself about how you will go out into the world each day using and applying these principles. Now, these are all wonderful principles. Is there, is there one that you think is the most important, and if so, why? I would say probably forgiveness is the most important. I put it toward the end of the book simply because it is one that people grapple with more often. But in the end, forgiveness, well, The Course in Miracles says if you want peace, forgiveness is the path to that peace. In the end, forgiveness is everything, because without it, we are still judging, we're still thinking that we have problems, we're still attached, we still are attacking and defending. Forgiveness is the thing that sets us free, really, from all of these worldly, fear-based thoughts that we have, so that we can be restored to this higher mind, higher self, and knowing that we are connected to something greater. Now, let's go a little deeper into some of these principles. Our world today seems to be filled with judgment on virtually every level. We see it in media, on the news, in daily life. How can we meet others without judgment? Well, the, the first thing is to get into that place of being the light. <laughs> so um, the practice of that is there are lots of different ways that that's spelled out in the book. But let's just take one very, very simple way. One way is to close your eyes, and people can do this even as they're listening right now. Close your eyes, take a couple of deep breaths, extend your arms in front of you with your hands palm up, and just imagine that divine love and light is flowing through you, down through the crown chakra, the top of your head, down through your body, and then you are extending it out through your hands through these outstretched palms, and that you're literally receiving divine love and you're giving it all at the same time. Now, as we do this, we don't have to be in control of where that energy is going. We don't have to direct it. We don't have to know how it's being used. We can just ask spirit to let it flow through us to be the eyes and ears and hands and feet of spirit and extend that into the world. When you feel that, even for a moment, that's being the light that you are, without trying to control anything, without making any judgments on who deserves love and who doesn't, 
who deserves prosperity and who doesn't. It's simply just being in the presence of love. That's what meeting others without judgment truly means. And to practice that, we really do need to do something daily, start our days with some kind of practice of meditation, prayer, journaling, taking a walk, getting connected to that higher self and feeling that love flow through us so that when we meet people through the day, we can just show up as that light and we can literally start to see the light in them. It's almost as though the body and the personality start to kind of fade away and you just see the internal light, the essence in that person. That's what it means to to be without judgment. Now, you know, when you think about that, walking into, let's say, a contentious meeting at work, where maybe you've um, got some history with your boss or a coworker. <laughs> I've never experienced that, so that's why I'm laughing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, this is just, you know, kind of far-fetched, just hypothetical. Mm-hmm, I understand. Let's just say, you know, any of the listeners have experienced such a thing. Imagine what it would be like to walk into that room, having already prepared yourself mentally to not judge anybody in that room, to not come in with any baggage, any past or any future, but to simply show up as that light and love and be present for whatever happens. When you do that, everything changes. There may still be conflict around you, but when you're not taking part in that, the energy has to shift. And the thing is that you get to maintain the place of peace that you're in You get to witness what's going on around you, but because you are not contributing to that conflict energy, you literally do help shape the outcome of that meeting. And it's not because you have expectations or you're writing the script for it. It's simply because you are bringing light into it. And that's how powerful it is. Absolutely. I know for me personally, self-love was one of my most challenging life lessons. And it wasn't until I reached my late 30s and 40s that I can truly say it was there for me. What are some of the ways we may foster Mm self-love? Well, one is um, one thing that I actually am a big believer in, and I say in the book that this may seem irrelevant, but it's actually one of my favorite ways to foster self-love, and I think one of the most effective ways. And that is to consistently bring beauty into your life and focus on beauty. Um, I remember years ago, I was I had a full time job, loved my boss, my coworkers, was not really in love with full time work because I always have been more of a, kind of a free spirit person. But I was in this full time job, very busy um, tasks, doing a lot of marketing kind of work, lots of deadlines. And one day, my boss said, "Okay, we're all going to go to the art museum." and spend half a day just looking at art for inspiration. Because we were in a creative line of work, right? We were doing copywriting and marketing and promotion. And so we all took the half day and went to the art museum. And I still remember that, even though it was so many years ago, because those moments of focusing on beauty helped fill me up so that I could go back into a very busy and stressful situation and bring a different part of myself to that. So whether it's, you know, looking at a beautiful view out your window, buying flowers, um, you know, go wherever and get a bouquet of flowers, put that on your desk, Uh, just do something every day, listen to Mozart, listen to Beethoven, something that fills you up, it will remind you of what you value. And as you do that, you will start to value yourself even more. Mm, Absolutely. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I think we all need an art and beauty break at some point during the day, huh? I think so, too. Yes, I think we would all be more peaceful and loving if we did. A few weeks ago, uh, I was talking to someone about the law of attraction. And uh, those of uh, I'm sure my listeners know and are familiar with the law of attraction. And I said, you know, I said, I've been lately getting, letting go of things that no longer work for me in my life or no longer support the type of life that I'm looking for. And I said, I guess I'm practicing the law of subtraction. If it doesn't work for you, <laughs> subtract it. And it turns out someone actually used that expression. I, I, I Googled it afterwards to make sure. Somebody did use that uh, in 2013, came up with that concept of the ideas of subtraction. But you say in principle number six, detach with 
love. How do we do that? Right. Well, this is where it's, uh, it goes back to standing in that power and that grandeur, that posture that I described a few moments ago, where you close your eyes, you put your hands out, your palms up. I call that the posture of grandeur because the grandeur is that remembering, that feeling of, oh, I'm part of something greater than myself, and I'm letting it flow through me. So detachment or attachment, let's talk about attachment first, that's always coming from fear in some way. You know, so often, well, I think one of the best examples is to look at romantic relationships and how we're taught about those. Everything from love songs to Hallmark movies and cards, even Valentine's Day, reinforces the idea that we have to be in a romantic relationship with someone in order to uh, be affirmed, to be valued. It's, you know, if you're single and you have a lot of couples around, you you know that feeling of kind of being the fifth wheel and like you're not seen as a whole person because you're not attached to someone. But what so often happens is that we get into these relationships expecting something of the other person. It's kind of like that line from Jerry Maguire, you know, that famous line of, you complete me. Mm. We enter into these relationships feeling incomplete and looking for wholeness in somebody else. So we get attached because we're thinking they will save us. They will make us, you know, if I, um, this is what my first marriage was based on. Mm. I didn't have a high opinion of myself. So I thought, well, you know, he will save me. He'll make me feel better about myself. I'll do the same thing for him. And so we will rescue one another. It's just not a very good, uh, good recipe. So detaching with love is really standing in that grandeur letting others be who they are, but detaching from those outcomes and expectations. Her book is Be the Light That You Are. My guest is Deb Engel, and we'll be back with more of Deb after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose, to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com I'm Little Teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle and here is my spout. No, that like this. When I get all steamed up, then I shout, tip. Me over it. Pull me out. <laughs> this is WWE superstar Roman Reigns. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Why should you volunteer with Meals on Wheels? I never thought that five minutes could make so much difference in the lives of two people, but it has. Drop off a warm meal and get more than you expect. Volunteer at americaletsdolunch.org. Brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. Text and work. Text and pretend to work. Text and act surprised when someone calls you out for not working. Who, me? Text and whatever. Just don't text and drive. Visit stoptextsstoprex.org. A message from NHTSA and the Ad Council. How to be a great dad in 15 seconds. Bike ride, go fish, walk in the park, phone call, milkshake, play catch, picnic, fly a kite, tell jokes, laugh, talk, read a story, tell a story, bumper car, swing set, bowling, pillow fight, cut loose, stay tight. Because the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Deb Engel. She's the author of Be the Light That You Are, 10 Simple Ways to Transform Your World with Love. Deb, principle number four is see only love. And you sort of alluded to this in an earlier segment. I can just imagine looking at the guy who just cut me off on a busy New York expressway and seeing only love. How can we achieve this? Right. Yep. Well, and that is the perfect example because it's something we all deal with every single day. To see only love in that situation, it's you know, let's use that example. The um, it is 
Well, I love this example, too, because just recently, probably a couple of weeks ago, I was driving down the freeway. I was feeling really good. I was listening to my guidance. Uh, Lots of information was flowing. And all of a sudden, somebody cut me off. And instantly, instantly, my ego was triggered and I wanted to go chase the guy down. So part of this is just being aware, being aware when we are triggered, when our egos start to feel attacked and we then try to defend ourselves. Once we reach that awareness, when we can say, oops, look at what's happening, then we can say, oh, that's just my ego mind flaring up. I'm aware and I understand what's going on. I know that's not me and I can make a different choice and see this differently. So then we can switch over despite how much our egos want to keep us trapped, trapped in that anger, we can switch over to that higher mind, that higher self, and we can say, okay, I'm going to look at this guy who just cut me off. I'm going to choose to see the light in him. Because have I ever cut somebody off? Yes. Have I ever been in a hurry? Have I been a jerk? Yes. Does that change the fact that I am the light of the world? No, I still am, and so is he. And that's what I'm going to choose to see, not to help him necessarily, although A Course in Miracles is very clear that when we do see the light in others, we do change them energetically. We are actually helping them remember the light that we are. But the thing that's so great about this is that seeing only love is a gift to ourselves, too. When I choose to see the love in that person who just cut me off, I'm restored to the peace and the remembrance of who and what I am as love. And then I get to go on with my day feeling good rather than being trapped in this old ugly tape of. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think that's something that uh, there are many situations, not only being cut off in traffic, but uh, someone being rude to us or uh, whatever it might be. And when someone's rude to me, I've gotten to the habit of saying, I wonder what's happening in their life right now that that's making them act out in that way and just sort of beam kind of compassion and love and find that that is very soothing. Uh, and sometimes it actually results in a proper conversation where, where things come out and you can share a, a tender moment of kindness with someone. So absolutely, I agree. Right. Yeah, I, I uh, subscribe to what I call the Bless and Release Program. Fishermen have the Catch and Release Program. <laughs> yes. Spiritual beings, human beings, we can have the Bless and Release. Bless and Release. Bless that and then let it go. That sounds wonderful. I, I really I really love that. Principle eight says, redefine the problem. Does that mean we look at situations proactively rather than reactively? Yeah, I think that's part of it. And it is really the idea that while problems, what we call problems, can show up in all sorts of different forms, financial, health, relationship problems, whatever, that they really are all coming from that belief that we're separate, separate from creator, from each other, from ourselves. Um, One really good example of how this works is that uh, the woman that I know, she's been working at a job for a while now that's very demanding. She's really good at it, but it is taking up all of her time. So even though it pays her well, it's depleting her energy in all sorts of other ways. And she's been trying to make a decision about whether to stay or whether to go. And so she was very much in this fear-based, reactive kind of place until we talked and really talked about what it meant to step back into the light, to be really clear about who she is, what, what she wants, what her gifts are. And once she was restored to that, then she could be proactive and say, yeah, you know, this is just not working for me. She didn't have to make the employer wrong, the situation wrong. She could just say, I let that be as it is, but I need to be who I am. And as soon as she got to that place, literally within the next day, she had three job offers or three job opportunities that came up. So this is how it works. You know, as soon as we get clear about who and what we are and what we will and won't accept in our life, Again, not out of blame, not out of attack, but simply out of love, then things show up for us. So the proactive part of it is that remembering and restoring ourselves to that grandeur. Absolutely. Principle two, 
apply the power of your mind. Is this intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, or a combination of these? It's really all of the above. It's, it goes back to that teaching that we have the ego, fear-based mind, and the higher love-based mind. And what I think is so interesting is to, as we start to become more aware, start to develop the spiritual muscle, we can pay more close attention to what is going through our minds. So often, we, you know, it's interesting that I, we exercise our bodies, we try to whittle our waist and develop other muscles in our bodies, be strong, but we don't necessarily pay much attention to what go through our, goes through our minds, and we don't necessarily believe that we can change that or that we can improve it. So a lot of this is about, again, becoming aware, knowing, okay, when am I in my fear-based mind? When am I in my loving mind? Choosing that loving mind more often, and then getting to the point where I realize, why would I ever want to be in that fear-based mind? What good comes from that? And I think that's part of the spiritual growth, that as we move forward, we become more conscious, we reach the tipping point where we see there really is nothing to be gained from being in that place of struggle and sacrifice and misery and attack and defense. Everything to be gained is in that being who we really are in light and in love. And so using that mind just becomes the logical thing to do, not because our mind is logical, (laughs) although it is, but simply because that's where everything we want in this world and in our lives comes from. Peace, well-being, prosperity, harmonious relationships, they're all available to us, but we've got to be in that higher mind to fully experience them. Absolutely. I remember seeing a bumper sticker years ago that said, practice random acts of kindness. What is the result of kindness without expectation? Mm. Well, I think that is, that's the full expression and extension of our function in this world. We truly are here to be loving, kind, joyful beings, the world will try in many, many ways to convince us that that's not true or that it's not possible and to distract us from that. But, you know, we all have experienced how a simple act of kindness can change things for us. One of my, something that I remember from years ago was a day that I was shopping after Christmas, going, you know, doing the after Christmas sales It was a slushy, cold day in Iowa, and as I was packing up all of the stuff in my car, I had the shopping cart there next to the car, and a gentleman came up and he said, could I take that cart back to the store for you? Such a simple thing, but it changed everything for me, because I felt like, ah, I'm not alone. Here's somebody who's compassionate and caring, and that very simple thing has stayed with me all these years. We just have no idea how much impact a small thing like that can have in this world, because we do pay those things forward. We do feel uplifted by them. And when we're restored to that sense of kindness in the world, we're more likely to extend that ourselves. Your final principle is set yourself free. Is that the cumulative effect of mastering the other nine principles? It really is. I use that word freedom or set yourself free because that's what it feels like. I think we have no idea how bound up we can be in this world because of all of the expectations and attachments and judgments that we have every day. But as we start to name those, see them, let them go, switch to a higher self, to the light, there is this great sense of freedom because now we can love the world but not feel as though we're responsible for controlling or changing it. And I want to be really clear about this, because sometimes people have the belief that, you know, if we're just being spiritual beings and we're just being the light, then we're not fully participating in life. And nothing could be further than the truth. Being the light that you are means if you want to march in a protest march, do it. But just show up with the, with the energy of love. Bless everybody there. Bless the people who seem to be the enemy or the other. Bring a sense of unity to it. You know, show up for town hall meetings or council meetings or 
uh, PTA meetings or church meetings or whatever it is, wherever you want to be active. and But bring a different energy to it. Show up with the intention of being someone who is there to unify and to find consensus, to bring a different energy to it. And so be as involved as you possibly can, but do it with the knowing that we don't have to fix the world to change the world. Just be the light that you are. Right. My guest is Deb Engel. She's the author of Be the Light That You Are, 10 Simple Ways to Transform Your World with Love. Deb, one more time, please tell our listeners where they can get your book and find out more about you and this wonderful work. My website is debraengel.com, D-E-B-R-A-E-N-G-L-E.com. And that lists all of my upcoming events, free teleclasses, upcoming courses, and, of course, you can find the books online and at your local bookstores as well. And tell us about the events that are happening in August and September. Right. In August, I'll be at Ferry Beach Retreat Center in Maine, right on the beach. Wonderful setting. It's August 24th through the 28th, and we'll be talking about hope. So it's going to be a really rich discussion, very interactive, with free time to go down to the beach and write, think, walk, um, and then hit, take part in wonderful discussions and aha moments. And then in September, I will be at the Omega Institute, September 13th through 15th, doing a workshop based directly on Be the Light That You Are. So we'll be going into lots of examples, lots of discussion, and again, interaction about how to really apply these principles in your life every single day. Deb, it's been a pleasure to have you back. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your new book. Thank you so much for having me. It's just been a joy. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the voice Furman. Have a wonderful week.